Jill decided to come to church today. <laughs> Are we up? Good morning. That was pretty weak. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Thank you for those of you who are here and participating online. If you're willing and able to stand, please do. Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, being able to gather together as a body of believers and fellowship together, worship together. Lord, so we just come together today and we focus our hearts to you. We shake off the cares of this world, the challenges of this world. Lord, and we lean on you and we lean on your presence. And so God, work in every heart in this room, work in every heart of those who are participating online. Lord, we just thank you that, that we can come together virtually and we can come together physically to worship you. Let us never take that for granted. And so God, we give you our praise this morning. We give you our hearts. Lord, this is your time and we love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. What a privilege it is to be in your house, Lord, and what a privilege it is to be your house. We praise you, Lord. How lovely is your 
dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I enter into your courts, O Lord, and sing with joy to you. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I enter into your courts, O Lord, and sing with joy to you. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. What joy for those who live in your house. Always singing praises. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. What joy for those who live in your house. Always singing praises. Sounds like yada. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. Listen to God speaking his love to your heart. He keeps his promises. Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16 say, um, it's God speaking God speaking this. So listen to listen to him say this about those who love him. It says because God says because he holds fast to me in love I will deliver him. God says he will deliver you. I will protect him because he knows my name. You hear these promises? When he calls to me, I will answer him. God says God says, I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold 
like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. makes us whole you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride
my cares on you. Cast my cares on you. Cast my cares on you, Lord. I trust in your promises. Your love is devoted. Thank you, Lord, that we can cast our cares on you. Cast our cares on you. feels bigger than my faith struggles steal my breath away my back's pressed up against the wall the weight of my worries stacked up tall you're strong enough to hold it all i will cast my cares on you troubles of this world for your peace inside my soul this fight's not what i would have chosen but you see the future no one knows yet you're still good when i can't see the working of your hands you're holding
my cares, I will cast my cares on you. Cast my cares, I cast my cares, I will cast my cares on you. Cast my cares, I will cast my cares, I will cast my cares on you. Lord God, we just ask that you uh, work in our hearts, that you help us to learn to cast our cares on you. Lord, there's burdens in life, the things in life that seem to weigh us down. Lord, we're not called to carry those. We're called to put those on your feet at the cross. Lord, you will take those burdens. You will take those cares. You will heal us of those things. So Lord, we cast our cares upon you. Hallelujah. You're the anchor of our hope. Lord, let us anchor our souls to you. Let us look to you. Let us know that you are for us and not against us. God, I thank you that you are for us. I thank you that you gave your life for each one of us, that you died for us and the penalty of sin and death in our life. Lord, that includes the things that this world may throw at us. You have protected us from us. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And so, Lord, we stand in your presence today and we cast our cares off our hearts onto you. You'll take those burdens. You'll hang on to those burdens. So, God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in each one of our lives, and we thank you for what you're going to do in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, before we get into the Word, I want to update you on our friends in Liberia. So, here's Daniel, as you know. Maybe. Somebody want to dim those? Can you dim those lights for a moment, Dave, before you come up? So that's Daniel. Um, he's, he's kind of the main contact that I have there, though I speak to others. Um, but last week, I want to update you on what happened during our service. So you know we prayed for them uh, at the beginning of service. And then during service, you can throw the next picture up. This is Daniel's sister. I don't remember her name, but this is his sister. So remember, they're about seven hours ahead of us. So right now, I'm not even going to try because I tried last week and I couldn't tell you it's 522 there. I did pretty good this time, right? And so uh, early in their morning, which would have been sometime our night, Saturday night, his sister collapsed and was unresponsive. And so during our service, he sent in, a, uh, so we've got some people who are watching our live feed and anybody that has any prayer requests during our service, they respond to that. And then also after, if you've ever been on our live feed, you get a message saying, Do, would you like prayer? We'll pray for you. And if they send in a prayer request, we, we pray for them. So while I was giving the message last week, uh, Daniel had sent in a, a message saying that his sister had collapsed in the morning, which would have been not our morning, but their morning, and has been unresponsive ever since. So one of our prayer partners had prayed for them online and then had texted me. So right after service, I went into the back and I sent a prayer and then I did a voice prayer also to him. And he said 30 seconds after we prayed, she woke up and asked for food. 30 seconds. So I don't know if it was 30 seconds after the first prayer, the second prayer, the third prayer. I don't think that it really matters. But 30 seconds after we prayed, she woke up and asked for food. And so I talked with Daniel this morning. She's home. She's doing well. She's been great since. Um, so that's his sister. Isn't she a beautiful woman? Yes. And so I, they don't know what happened, what the cause was, but she's well in Jesus' name. And so they're very thankful. So he wanted me to make sure I shared that testimony with you all this morning that through our prayers in Eau Claire, 30 seconds later in Liberia, she woke up. And she asked for food, which reminds me, you know, Jesus, when Jesus would raise people from the dead, he would say, give them some food, right? So we don't know how close to death she was. In his text or in his message, he said she was close to death. 
So we don't know how sick she was. I don't know all the details. I just know that she was unconscious and unresponsive for hours. Uh, and then after praying, uh, she woke up and asked for food. Isn't that good? God is good. And the next picture we looked at last week, this is a picture of some of the elderly that are in Liberia that they're struggling to feed. And I mentioned last week that on our, on our online giving, there's now an option to give to Liberia uh, for food for Liberia. So we want to send some money over to them to help buy food for the elderly. So if you're willing to do that, on, if you're doing online giving, if you're uh, participating online, or that's typically how you give, you'll see that as an option when you go to give, or you can do it on your envelope here, just write Liberia behind how much you want to give them. And so towards uh, probably the end of next week or early the week after, I'd like to send over some money to help feed the elderly. One of the elderly just passed away um, in the last day. They told me this morning, I don't know if it was of starvation or not, but they're very hungry. So as you, as, as you recall, I've instructed, he, he, he was trying to uh, figure out how to help them all, and I said, help one at a time, and then help another, and then help another. So last week, we looked at a chicken coop that he had built for one of the elderly so they could keep their chickens safe. And, and so they're, they're doing what they can. Um, they have what they call the migration department that kind of is around the borders of the cities, and so they can't get in and out very easily. So for him to go from his house to his farm, he has to go through migration, and then they usually sleep on the farm for a couple days to get back to the, to the city. And so it's very difficult for them right now with, with COVID as it is for many people around the world. So, so before we go on, I just want to pray for them. I want to just thank God for the miracle um, last week. I've been rejoicing all week, excited about telling you about it, because that's good. And God does good things. And so let's just pray for Liberia and pray for, um, and just thank him for what he's doing there. Amen. So God, we just thank you for those in Liberia. We thank you for Daniel and his faithfulness. Lord, I thank you that, that he is contacting me on a daily basis almost, and sometimes more than once a day. Lord, just letting me know that they're doing well, letting me know that they're praying for us in Eau Claire. And so Lord, I thank you for the power of prayer, and I thank you that last week we saw an example of the power of prayer. Lord, that you raised a woman from we don't know how sick to up and eating in a matter of seconds after prayer. And God, that's the God that we serve. You are the God that we serve. That's who you are. We know, we read scripture, where you just, you, you heal people from a distance. And so God, we can pray for those in Liberia from the United States, and you can touch them immediately while they're in another country. And Lord, even while they pray for us, I thank you that their prayers are being answered. Lord, they're praying for this congregation, they're praying for our church, they're praying for our city, they're praying for our nation. And so, Lord God, I thank you for their prayers for us. I thank you, Lord, that you are working in that body of people in Liberia through New Beginnings Church. Lord, though it's not organized and we're kind of figuring out what that should look like, Lord, I thank you that you made that connection. Lord, because it's a divine connection. It's a connection that could only be made by your hand. And so, God, I thank you that you've made that connection. I thank you that we can help uplift them, that we can help support them even just spiritually through prayer. Lord, and that they participate in our services, Lord. They get to experience our worship. Lord, they worship with us. They hear the word together with us. So God, I thank you that you're working in that nation. Lord, I pray for their safety. I pray for easy travel from the homes to the farm. Lord, I pray that you continue to grow their farm, Lord, because now they're growing their own food for themselves because it's hard to get food in. And I thank you that you're blessing that, those crops, even now as we're praying, that you're blessing that land, you're making that land fertile. So when they spread the seed and when they plant crops, Lord, that you prosper those crops. Make them bountiful, Lord. Help them to feed everyone in their community. So God, we love and thank you. We know that you're working all over this earth, not just here in Eau Claire, not just in New Beginnings Church, but all over the world. We see your hand in everything. And Lord, it's beautiful to me to see your hand working all over at the same time. So God, we love you, we thank you, and we give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good news, amen? I was so excited uh, Sunday afternoon when I heard that news. And I've been kind of, uh, I've been checking all week, how is she doing? And she's home and she's doing good. And this, that's the first picture he sent me was this morning. I haven't seen a picture of her till this morning. So beautiful woman. And I'm glad that God is working in Liberia. Um, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through the book of Daniel. And uh, God had put that on my heart a few weeks ago. And I didn't realize 
how appropriate that that series would be during the time that we're living in right now. And so I know some of you are not here on Wednesday nights, but we do stream it. It's, uh, it's out on our YouTube channel. Alex is going to put our web address up. So if you go out to our website, you can go to online services and you can listen to those messages. Um, but we, uh, two weeks ago, we talked on Daniel 1 and we talked about our unshakable identity. You know, we are children of God and this world cannot change our identity. And we see things happening all over the world today that try to change who we are. But we're children of God, and we need to stand on that no matter what comes against us. This week we talked about our unshakable kingdom. And we talked about how the kingdoms of earth rise and fall. We see it through scripture, we see it through history, and we're seeing it today. You know, we have a president that's in the, in the country, in our, in, our, in, our, in our White House. He's not going to be there forever. He may be there another term. You know, we see other countries rising and falling. And the only kingdom that continues to expand is the kingdom of God. And so we talked about how unshakable our kingdom is and how we are ambassadors in this earth representing the kingdom of God. We're no longer citizens of this earth. We're citizens of heaven and we're ambassadors living in this earth, right, representing God. And so those are the, the two messages that we've done on Daniel. I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to those, to, to go out and watch and listen to those because I feel they're just timely right now for what's going on in our world. Amen? And so, on to today, um, we've, been, we've been going through Psalms, and we've been talking about Psalms in troubled times. And so, last week we started uh, talking about taking a few weeks focusing on prayer, and, and within our series of Psalms, and, and to take a handful of Psalms and look at it, those in these next few weeks, and ones that were written out of the midst of some significant situation in the psalmist's life. So last week, if you were here, we looked at hopelessness and depression. And, and, I, and, and you know, I felt, I felt in my heart I needed to share um, from, from a, I guess, from a, the worldly view what depression is and what causes depression and then apply that scripturally. And, and thank you for those who contacted me and said that that's what you needed to hear. Because, again, I think it's timely. And so today we're going to talk about rest for the anxious, rest for the anxious. And, um, you know, when we, when we look at the Psalms and we look at the psalmists in, in Psalms, especially when they're dealing with, with a struggle like we'll see today, the situation is either some kind of a terrible circumstance that's putting pressure on them from the outside, or it's a problem within their own heart. So think about your life and think about when you're dealing with a struggle. A lot of times that struggle is caused by pressure from the outside, right? So Ted keeps, Ted keeps persecuting me. That would be pressure from the outside, right? Or there's a problem or struggle going on in my own heart. So it's pressure from the inside. And so when you look at the book of Psalms and you see there's a challenge or a psalmist is, is expressing a challenge, typically it's one of those two things. It's that outside pressure or that inside pressure or both. And so often, often we do see both. And so we're looking at issues. So last week we looked at depression. Today we're going to look at anxiety. Uh, we're going to look at doubt. We're going to look at suffering. But I want us to go to Psalm 3 today. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 3. And this is a prayer for the, of the anxious. David is very anxious in this prayer. And so um, I'm going to read it out of the New King James. He says, Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there's no help for him in God. So that's pressure from where? The outside, right? Because he's saying many. He's saying they have increased, and he's saying many again. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts me up, up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and sleep and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands, ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. So there are several things that are kind of working against us as Christians right now. As I read that psalm, as I, as I talk about anxiety, bear with me. And some of you, and my guess is a lot of you, may not be leaning in and thinking, yep, I need to hear this because I'm anxious. Or this is not for me because I'm not an anxious person. 
And, and I think there's a couple reasons why this might be the case. First, that we, have to, we may not realize how common anxiety is in our world. And a lot of us may not think of ourselves as anxious people. I don't think of myself as an anxious person, but I do have times of nervousness, and I do have times of worry, and I do have times of stress, which is really a type of anxiety, right? So I'm going to kind of go from the psychological aspect in the beginning of this message. You know, all of us become anxious at different times and in different degrees. So something may be, you know, I may hear there's a thunderstorm coming. I love thunderstorms, but let's say I don't. I'm afraid of them. And so I may hear that there's a thunderstorm coming, so I get a little bit anxious about it. You know, and Dave may just go completely ballistic and go hide under his bed because he, he hates thunderstorms. So we're both ex ex experiencing some kind of anxiety. His is just a little bit more severe than mine because he's hiding under his bed, right? I'm just a little bit nervous by it. And so there is a spectrum of anxiety, and I want to talk about that for a moment. And there's different words that we use today uh, to talk about the different places kind of along this spectrum. So the lowest level of anxiety would be considered nervousness. How many have ever been nervous? If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. We've all been nervous at one time or another, right? This is when you start to become just a little bit emotionally uneasy about something, right? And, and it could be something on the horizon in your future. It could be something that's looking uncertain. It could be a meeting that you're going to have 30 seconds from now. You're just a little bit nervous about it. So you have a meeting with your boss, and you're not sure if he's going to chew you out or she's going to chew you out because you did the right thing, and they think you did the wrong thing, so you get a little bit nervous. Or it could be something that's 10 years out. And you think about it, and it just kind of gives you this nervousness. Maybe it's your kids getting married and leaving home, and you feel a little bit nervous about that. So in this sense of nervous, uh, if, that, if this sense of nervousness increases, then it, we call it worry. So we start with nervousness, but then it excels to worry. And, and what happens when we start to worry is when we worry about something, it keeps entering our mind, and it keeps entering our heart. So nervousness is kind of just that uneasy, oh, i got a meeting tomorrow, I'm just a little bit uneasy about it, but I can dismiss it. Worry kind of enters your mind, and it, and it continually kind of keeps poking at you. Not bad, but it's like, okay, I'm worried. You know, I'm worried. And we start to think sometimes and imagine the possible outcomes. And then if worry kind of gets kicked up another notch, then we start using the word anxious, right? I'm anxious. And if that continues, um, we may say that we have an anxiety problem. Because if we're anxious a lot, we probably have an anxiety problem. And this is where we're coming to, uh, this is uh, when we're coming to terms with it in our life a bit more. And if we see that pattern, uh, or, if it, uh, or if it's too intense and, and we ignore it, then the next, the next phase is fear. It's just outright fear. You're not anxious anymore, you're crawling under your bed, right? So we're fearful that, and, and we're in such distress and we begin to worry about things that may be negative and, and we're thinking, how are they going to affect my future? How are they going to come and affect my life? And when we become fearful, when that negative thing or that terrible thing most certainly like, looks like it's headed our way, we get that panic, right? And, and so, you know people who are afraid of spiders? I had a friend who's afraid of spiders and one day we're driving down the road fast, like 50 miles an hour, and I made a joke that there was a spider on the floorboard on his side of the car. He opened the car door and was going to jump out. I was going 50 miles an hour. That's how afraid, I didn't realize that's how afraid of spiders he was. I knew he was a chicken, but I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize that he was that fearful. And I felt bad because I thought I almost killed him, you know, joking that there was a spider in the car. That's fear when you react in such an un unreasonable, unconsciousable, un uh, whatever the word I'm trying to think of, way that just doesn't make sense. So even he didn't see the spider, just having the logic that there might be a spider by his foot just scared him so bad he was ready to jump out of a car that was moving at 50 miles an hour. That's fear, right? That's kind of that worst level of anxiety. And so at that furthest end of the spectrum, we're so anxious and fearful, sometimes we're paralyzed. You've seen people who are so afraid that they can't even move, they can't get up, they can't get out of whatever it is. And, and we're so struck with uncertainty that we don't know what to do, then we don't eat, right? And then we don't sleep because we're so worried about what's going to happen, so we stay awake. And, and when we're anxious, by now our mind is racing for hours. And so anxiety, keep in mind, is a spectrum all the way from nervousness to fear, right? Nervousness, worry, fear, anxiousness, 
fear. And, and some of us, or probably all of us, wind up somewhere on that spectrum in our lives because we all get nervous about stuff. Or we're all, some of you may be afraid of spiders. Some of you may not be, right? Some of you may be afraid of lightning. And so it just, it just depends. But we often wind up on that spectrum somewhere. So bear with me. Another reason why we may not kind of lean forward and, with this issue is, is that we don't really think of it as a problem. We don't think of fear, worry, anxiousness as a problem. And so maybe we get annoyed that we get anxious about things, but we don't really see it as a moral issue. You think, well, I'm not sinning. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just worried, right? And, and sometimes we figure God's probably pretty neutral about it. But let's, let's look at that for a moment. There, there, are some, there are some forms of nervousness, fear, and anxiety that are completely normal and completely healthy. So if I'm sleeping at night, I'm supposed to have a measure of fear if I hear somebody breaking into my house, right? God created that emotion in us for those times when we're supposed to feel them, right? I'm not just supposed to go, oh, somebody's breaking in, break in quieter so I can get a good night's sleep, right? Just let them do it. Um, so, but there's complexities here, and we don't want to neglect all of it, all the various focus, uh, factors that lead into it. But the Bible is very clear that, that much of our anxiety is, is a bigger problem than we think it is. I want you to walk away with that today. Much of your anxiety is a bigger problem than you think it is. It's often not a neutral issue in God's eyes. We may think, well, I'm only worrying, and, or, or I'm only a little bit nervous, or I'm only anxious, that's not neutral in God's eyes. So we all know Matthew 6. Let's look at Matthew 6, 25 through 34. He says, therefore I say to you, this is Jesus talking, do not worry. So there's worry is on the spectrum of anxiety, right? About your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is, life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the valley, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We're going to talk about that in a moment. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Unto you. Therefore, here's the important line, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Then if we look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul is commanding us not to be anxious. He says, be anxious for nothing, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So Jesus and Paul, so we, talk, we read Jesus' words in Matthew 6, we read Paul's words in Philippians 4, so Jesus and Paul consider anxiety an issue, right? We're not supposed to be anxious, they're saying. Don't be anxious. So Psalm 3, if we go back to Psalm 3, it's here to help us. And it's here to help us exchange our anxious fretting for joyful, restful faith in God. We have the choice to take our anxiety and switch it and trade it for joyful, restful faith in God. You know, anxiety will suck the joy out of your life. Those of you who've dealt with anxiety know that. It will suck the joy out of your life. I've never heard anyone say that they wish they had more anxiety in their life. Oh, I got another day to be anxious. I'm so excited. Right? Never heard that. And, and yet, when we're anxious, we keep God at an arm's length. We tend to. We don't do it on purpose, I don't think, but that's just a natural consequence of anxiety. Bear with me, it'll make sense. So Jesus is ready to come up to us right now and to take all of our mental, emotional burdens. We just have to be willing to give them to him, right? Peter says, and, and we just sang this song in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, he cares for you, right? For he cares for you. So Jesus wants to take our anxieties. He wants to take our fears, he wants us to be able to rest from the busyness and of the mental circus that may be going on in our lives and rest in him. 
So Psalm 3 is going to help us in a few ways. It will help us to understand our anxieties, and it'll show us how to get out of them. Okay? So the, th the first two verses show us how to understand our anxiety. And, and you can think about anxiety as two levels. Okay? So there's a surface level and there's a deeper level. How many know what an iceberg is? You all know what an iceberg is, right? You look at the iceberg and there's a small bit of ice on the ocean, right? But we don't know what's underneath. There could be, uh, you know, a hundred times more ice below. And so anxiety is a little bit like that. So there's the, the part of the ice that's on the water and the deeper part is submerged underneath the water. The part of the iceberg that's on the, on the surface is very obvious, right? You can see it with your eyes. And, and sometimes that's all there is. It's just a block of ice floating on the ocean. But the ships never really know that. They use their sonar and then it can detect all that. But there are other times that the, the iceberg has very deep roots, right? It's, it's deep down into the ocean and it takes some work to see it. And so there's a level of anxiety in our lives that's obvious to see. And there's a deeper level of anxiety that takes a little bit more work to see. With me so far? Okay, you're all here? So we see these two levels reflected in Psalm 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. He says, Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are those who rise up against me. Many are, those, are, many are they who say of me, there is no help for him, God. Let me read that again. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And so the surface level of anxiety that David is having is fairly obvious from his situation. There are people against him, right? He says it three times. He says that, 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 that many have, they've increased. He says the word many twice. And so there's people against him, not just one, right, but a whole bunch of people. And we'll look at this in, in what happened and what led to this in a moment. And they're not just passively disliking him. They're not just sitting across the aisle in church going, I, you know, Joan and... and um, Bonnie, I don't like, they don't like each other, they're passive. I know they love each other. That, but this is not what's happening with David. They're after him, right? They're chasing him. They're actively rising against him. And so David is certainly tempted to be anxious. Again, verse 1, notice his distress. Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. You know, if we go to the first line of the psalm before verse 1, it points us to the specific situation. It says, this is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So David's son, Absalom, was after him, right? So David was on a run uh, a lot of his, he was on the run a lot of his life, wasn't he? And it, he was typically running from people, right? He didn't run from other things. He, he ran against Goliath. He ran against a bear, right? But uh, he typically, when he ran, he ran against people um, that he would have expected to like him, right? His own son, he was after him. So if we were to go back, we're not going to, we'll go there in a minute and look at uh, just a couple of verses, but if you were to go back and read 2 Samuel 15, it tells us what happened here. It tells us that David was the king of Israel, and his son Absalom, Absalom wanted David off the throne. He wanted to be king, right? And he was very clever about it, and he was very deceitful about it. So if someone had a serious legal issue, they would go to Jerusalem to get that legal issue settled. And when they came, Absalom would greet them. So he'd kind of be waiting, oh, here comes Ted with a legal issue. I'm going to jump out and, and I'm going to greet him and get ahead of him. And, and then he would tell them, that I would, he would tell Ted there's nothing that could be done. And the, the legal issue that you have and the problem you have is all David's fault. So you see the underhandedness and the slyness that, that Absalom is he's interrupting. Then he's telling Ted that it's, there's nothing we can do, and, but it's David's fault, Right? And then he would say, you know, if I were the king, Ted, things would be so different. You wouldn't have this problem. If I were the king, you'd be all okay. And so over time, after doing that repeatedly, that changed the public's opinion of David. So think about, we're, we're getting on presidential debate season, right? Think about a presidential debate. You know the town hall version where all the people come together and they come up and they ask the candidates questions? So they usually ask the, the current president a question and the other candidate a question. So imagine a debate and the president's not there, whoever the president may be at the time this debate's going on. But the candidate who's running against the president is there. And every time a question is asked, the candidate says, you know, you know, James, your situation is just horrible. I'm sorry you have to go through that. It's the president's fault. 
and, and I can fix it. And then the next person comes up. Mick, you know, I'm sorry you're going through this. It's the president's fault, but I can fix it. Joan, I'm really sorry you're going through this. It's the president's fault. I can fix it. So the president can't speak for himself. So this is what Absalom is doing. He's interrupting the people as they come to the city. Oh, sorry, not much we can do, but it's David's fault. But if I were king, you wouldn't have this problem. And that's what Absalom is doing to David. And so when he, when he thought it reached a tipping point in, 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 in public opinion, Absalom then proclaimed himself as king. Right? He took the throne and he gathered an army. And David knew that Absalom would come and strike down the whole city, so he fled. So if we look at 2 Samuel 15, 14, it says, So David said to his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake, and suddenly, overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. So eventually Absalom came after David with his army, right? So Psalm 3, David says, many people are against me. It's Absalom and his army, isn't it? And so we're not surprised at this point if David is tempted a little bit to be anxious. I'd be anxious, right? I'd be anxious if you all went and got another pastor and you came to kill me. I'd, I'd stress out a little bit. Um, I don't think we have that happening today. But So uh, David lost his role as king, right? His son took it from him. Uh, and, and his son, his own son hates him, right? You have to hate your father to do something like that. And his close friends are now against him. They're probably part of this army that's chasing him down. And he's wondering if he's going to die. Are they going to kill me? And so his circumstances are threatening any hope for a safe future. And that's what anxiety is all about. It's that fearful uncertainty about our future. Usually when you're stressing, worrying, nervous, anxious, it's not about what happened yesterday. It's about what could happen today tomorrow, a week from now, right? And it rises when we look to the future and we can't be certain that everything's going to turn out okay. And that's kind of the way we are in our world right now. Is everything going to be okay? Am I going to catch COVID? You know, is our, is our police in this country going to be disbanded? Are we going to, you know, is, is, is our nation going to fall apart? And we start to worry and fret over some of those things. And... Um, and this is why we begin to be nervous. This is why we begin to worry. This is why we become anxious. And this is why some people become fearful. So, you know, another example is you look at your bank account. And, and, and you look at your bills. And you're like, uh-oh, there's not enough money to pay the bills. You're going to worry and become anxious, right? Or maybe you're waiting for test results, medical test results, to find out what's going on with your health. So while you're waiting for those results, everything runs through your mind. You think, oh, it must be cancer. Right? And here you just got a, a bellyache from pizza or whatever. I don't know. Um, or, or it rises when someone says they want to get together and talk with you and you're not quite sure what it's about. You know, Ted, we need to have a meeting. Let's get together and talk. Let's do it right away. And if I approached Ted like that, he'd probably get a little anxious. Oh, what did I do? You know, I did something wrong. Or you're maybe afraid to publicly speak. That's a mild form of nervousness, right? And, and it, so it rises when you're asked to pu public speak. But there is that, so that's the surface anxiety, like the tip of the iceberg, but there's a deeper level of anxiety. So in verse 1, the people are rising up against David and they're threatening his life. But in verse 2, the temptation strikes a little bit deeper. It says, many are they who say of me, there is no help from him in God. So it's one thing to have people running against him, right, and coming to get him, but it's another to start wondering, does God even want to help me, right? That's his deeper level. If we look at the English Standard Version of Psalm 3, 2, it says, Much are saying of my soul, there's no salvation. Or you can use the word deliverance for him in God. So they're telling David, or they're telling each other, there's no salvation for David's soul. So what does that mean? And, and David may be referring to a specific situation. When David was fleeing from one town to another, uh, a man named Shimei took, him, took it upon himself to follow David and curse him. And as David walked along the road, the guy walked along the hillside throwing rocks at him. And so, for example, uh, he said to David in Samuel 16, 7, and 8, 
And Shemi said this when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought, you, brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom under the, under the, into the hand of Absalom, your son. Now you are caught in your own evil. You are a bloodthirsty man. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? So Shemi was basically saying, David, you're worthless. David, God is punishing you for sin. And he's saying that God was not on David's side. God's not for him. God was against him. And he's saying there's no hope. And to say that there's no salvation for him and God is to say that his future is certainly over, right? So, so there's nothing that David can do about it, and there appears to be nothing that God can do about it in David's eyes at this point in the psalm. And so David has no control over that situation, and by what people are saying, God doesn't really care about it, right? So this shows us the second deeper level of anxiety. So David already had trouble all around him, but this is a different kind of trouble. Now thinking, is God against me? Is God out to get me? Is there no salvation for my soul? And that presses deeper inside of him. And, and when we, what we see here is, is that the deeper level of anxiety, get this because some of you may not like this, but that deeper level of anxiety is really about unbelief in God. Amen. Ouch. That deep level anxiety is about unbelief in God. It's about whether or not David can trust God Right? They're saying there's no salvation for his soul, but can David trust God? That deep level of anxiety that David is having here is about his trust in the Lord. It's not about the people chasing him. It's about his trust in God. Will he trust that God is out for his good? So when we face an uncertain future, we may be tempted to become anxious. Right, That happens. But that anxiety, if it becomes paralyzing, it will become paralyzing when we believe the statement there is no salvation for you in God. If we believe that in the bottom of our heart, we're, we're going to give up, right? So there may be stuff going around. COVID is, is going around. There may be riots going around our country. There may be civil unrest. There may be injustices happening. You may not be working right now because of COVID. You may be struggling financially because of COVID. That will bring some anxiety. But then if you start believing in your heart, there's no hope that God can help you. That takes you to a deeper level almost a paralyzing level of anxiety, doesn't it? We're not just worried anymore, we're petrified, or we're deeply anxious. So when we don't believe in God's care for us, our anxieties just dig deep. It's like that iceberg. It just digs deeper and deeper and deeper into our hearts. Or to put it another way, the root that lies underneath our deeper anxieties is unbelief. Let that sink in for a moment. It's unbelief in God's ability or he's unwilling to help. So when we're going through something, yes, we get anxious, but if we start disbelieving God's ability or disbelieving that he's willing to help, that's going to make that anxiety seep deeper into our lives. It's an unbelief that there can be help from God or, that he, he, or even believing that he cares. And so it's easy to point, uh, it's easy at this point to say, no, I do believe in God. It's easy to say, I believe that he loves me. It's easy to say, I believe he cares for me. It's easy to say, no, I have no unbelief in my heart. But if we have deep anxiety, we are struggling with unbelief. Get that this morning. Even if we believe something in our minds, that doesn't mean we believe it in our gut. Right? I can believe in my head because the word says God loves me, but is it in my heart? Is it in my gut? Is it in my soul? Right? We may have mental belief, but functional disbelief. Right? I can believe that it won't rain today, but deep in my gut, uh, there's a good chance it probably will, right? There's a difference between those two beliefs. So meaning at the level of, of, everyday, um, of everyday life, uh, we function without faith if we have that un deep unbelief. We function without faith. This is why Jesus, when he tells his disciples that they're anxious in Matthew 6, he ends that verse in Matthew 6 with, O oh, you of little faith. Right? It has nothing to do with where's the food, where's the clothes, what's... It? No, you don't have faith. Right? He's saying that they don't believe at all. He's not saying they don't believe at all. He's saying that at some level they don't believe. There are degrees of faith. We all know that. Anxieties will rise and fall in our lives. It's really an opposite proportion of faith. The more anxious you are, the weaker your faith becomes. The more you let anxiety dwell in your life, the weaker your faith becomes. 
the more that you let your faith rise, it will overcome that anxiety. It's just a natural balance, right? It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't just show us that we have worry over a problem. It shows us that we have a faith issue in our lives. I know I'm hitting some, hitting some nerves today. To some degree, when we're dealing with deep anxiety, we are not trusting God. So why is it a faith problem? Jesus tells the disciples that God is their father and he cares for them. Right? Do you all believe that? God is our father, he cares for us. And if you really believe that, you won't be paralyzed by fear. Because God says no weapon formed against you will prosper. Right? God will protect us. We know that as believers. So in David's case, if he believed that God was against him, he would be paralyzed by fear. He was tempted to believe that God was unwilling or unable to help him. And so that's that deeper level of anxiety. It's the trouble underneath our trouble. It's the unrest underneath the unrest. And so how do we get out of anxiety? So now that we know what it is, we know what the surface anxiety is. It could be whatever situation is going on in our life. The deeper level of anxiety is a faith issue, right? That got you. So this situation is happening. I'm not sure that God can help me through this then you start to deepen your anxiety, right? So there's a path out of anxiety, and I'm going to give you a three steps, very easy, up front, and then I'll show you where these are coming from. First, rest in God, number one. We'll talk about these as individuals. Number two, look at the king. And number three, care about somebody else's problems. If you follow those three steps, your anxiety will dissipate. So first, rest in God, rest in God. This, this is on the other side of unbelief, right? If the root problem of our great anxiety or worry is unbelief or a lack of faith, then the answer is what? Faith and belief, right? So not just mental agreement that God is for us, but deep, genuine rest in God. That's how we get that faith strengthened up. Deep, uh, genuine rest in God. So since our problem is functional unbelief, we need functioning faith. Right? So David's faith, this is what he has. Look at Psalm 3, verse 3. Flowing right out of it. So now, remember verse 1 and 2, he's talking about they're increasing against him. Many are after him, many are after him. And then he says, they tell me that God isn't for me. He's not going to deliver me. But in verse 3, he says, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. So do you see the first words? But, right? That's a contrast, isn't it? He doesn't say, many are rising against me, therefore, I'm anxious and paralyzed with fear. He doesn't say, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God, therefore, I am constantly worried. He, instead, he says, but, right? Many are against me, they're saying, God is not for me, but. He's saying, this is my troubling circumstance, God, but you are my shield. But God, you are my glory. But God, you are the lifter of my head. So notice David trusts that about God. Doesn't matter what people are doing or saying, he trusts those things about God. And, and that um, is a metaphor for protection. David may not have a real shield with him to guard him if someone comes after him, but his true shield, God, will protect him, right? He says, God, you are my shield. His anxiety, in anxiety, he would functionally believe that God was not a shield for him, that God is against him, if that were the case, that's anxiety, but in faith, he trusts that God is for him. In anxiety, we would say, nope, God's against me. In faith, we say, God is for me. He also trusts that God is a lifter of his head. When David was on the run from Absalom, and it says in 2 Samuel 15, 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and his head, had his head covered as he went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. That's a pretty sad picture, right? He's, his son is taken over. He's leaving. He's got his head covered. He's crying. That's a pretty big picture of de dejection, isn't it? But David ends up trusting that God will lift him out of that, that God will lift him up again. David fought anxiety by trusting in God. You can fight anxiety by trusting in God. When we see God as our protector and the one who lift us up when we're cast down, anxiety gets pushed out of your heart. You can't have both. Increase your faith, the anxiety gets pushed out. Increase anxiety, increase distrust in God, your faith starts to decrease. It's like one or the other. 
And so we know that our future may be uncertain to us, but it is certain that God is for us and God loves us. And if we, if we believe that in the depth of our heart, your anxieties will calm. Your anxieties will calm. Let's look at the restfulness of faith. So David has faith. One way to think about faith is to see it as resting. So as our faith increases, we rest more, don't we? And so faith is an anxiety-calming power. It's the best anti-anxiety medicine that you can get. Faith. Not a pill, but faith. It puts your mind and your heart at rest. That's why he said in Psalm 3, he rests in God. Faith is not just believing certain things about God, it's resting in God. I love it when I can just visualize myself falling in the arms of God and he holds me up. I'm going through struggle and I may lay down in my bed at home and I visualize myself falling in the arms of Jesus and he's holding me. That's resting in God. David doesn't just believe that abstractly and he doesn't believe abstractly that God protects. He rests in that God is his protector. So rest is a very helpful way of thinking about faith, especially when you're dealing with anxiety. So anxiety or anxiousness is a very unrestful state because your mind is spinning, right, when you're anxious. You lay awake at night when you're anxious, thinking about all the uncertain things in the future. Oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's, this could happen. This could happen. No, maybe this will happen. And if that happens, this is going to happen. And you start to do the domino thing in your head. Well, if this, if A plus B equals C, then G, right, whatever. And, and we wonder what we could have done differently, and we wonder what we should do, and we, we're wound up all the time, and we feel exhausted and tired, because it's very tiring to live an anxious life. It wears you out, physically and mentally, because your mind is always awake and spinning. The opposite of, unrest, the, opposite of the unrest of anxiety is restful faith. Restful faith. When we rest in God, our minds will rest from, those anxious spinning, from its anxious spinning. And he's talking about a faith-filled sleep. When we rest in God, we'll be able to literally sleep, rest, right? That's why I love verses 5 and 6 in Psalm 3. It's a perfect picture of how faith fights anxiety. I lay down, so this David, now people are after him. He's, he's being told that God doesn't love him, but, right? Then he says, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around, right? So why is he talking about sleep? Because a restful mind will enable you to have a restful night's sleep. Think about David's situation. If he believed the lie that God was not his salvation, that there was no salvation for him in God, he probably would not have been able to sleep, right? He, his heart would have been in turmoil. He would have been up all night worried about who's going to attack him. He would have been frantically planning and replanning his next moves. He would have been paranoid and in, in, in anxiousness. But because he rested in God's care for him, his mind was able to stop its anxious reeling and he was able to go to bed, right? Even when he was being hunted down by an army. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing this message a few weeks ago, I don't even remember what the issue was, but I woke up, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning and my head was spinning. I was dealing with a situation with a person or something. I don't remember what it was. That's how, that's how minor it was. But I laid for two hours, couldn't sleep. I just kept spinning in my head. Oh, what if I do this? And what if this happens? And what if I do that? And what if that happens? So I was worried and anxious about this situation. I don't remember what the situation was. I remember the outcome of the night, but I don't remember what caused the anxiousness, which is God's grace. So I could have made a good case that it wasn't anxiety, that I was just worried about the situation. I had concern. You know, we sometimes use other words to hide. I'm not anxious. I'm just concerned, right? Um, but I was under a bit of stress about something, and, 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 there, and there's truth to that. There was anxiousness there. But, but it would also be true to say that I was anxious and I was also un unbelieving and I didn't have faith. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been toiling me so much. And so I wasn't resting in bed because I was not resting in God. I wasn't resting in bed because I wasn't resting in God. So finally, it hit me, God, this is not my problem. This is your problem. I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm going to get a good night's sleep. And whatever the solution will be, it'll be, right? And I prayed and I trusted him and I went to sleep. And now it's not always that easy, trust me. <laughs> 
In fact, I think I had to trust him a few times that night because I think it lasted for about 15 seconds and I started to doze off and the thoughts started coming back again. I'm like, no, God, I trust you. I put this in your hands. And so sometimes that restful faith will last 15 seconds, but that's okay because you're on the right track, right? Our mind starts to reel. We trust God and sometimes it's 15 seconds later we're wound up again. So we give it back to God and maybe he'll give you 30 seconds. And the next time he'll give you a couple minutes. Or the next time he'll give you an hour. And so when that happens, we need to trust him again, and trust him again, and trust him again. And so let's be honest, sometimes we only live by faith in 15-second intervals, depending on what's going on in life. I can only think 15 seconds ahead, because I don't know what's going to happen, right? But our hope is to slowly, over time, increase those frequency bursts of 15 seconds of faith, and make them longer and longer and longer. So after I finally turned that over to God, I probably had the most restful night of sleep that I had in in months. I don't remember what the situation was. I don't remember what the solution is. I remember that I was unrestful. I remember recognizing that I needed to give it to God and have faith and believe that God would take care of it. And I remember that it caused rest. That's enough for me, right? It's enough for me. That's what David did in verse 3. So our first step is to rest in God. Number two... It points us to look at the king. So what does that mean? As a human who suffers just like we do, we can kind of identify with David, right? We can identify with that temptation to be anxious. And we can learn from his faith. And that's what we have done, is we've learned to rest in God, right? When we're anxious. But we're, we're supposed to learn something here from David. And we're also supposed to look at him. And actually not just look at him, but look at the greater king. Because David was just an earthly king. There's a greater king coming. So David's example in this psalm points us forward to the true David, Jesus, right? We're we're to look to Jesus, the true king. So let me me break this down for you. We know that this is true because Psalm 3 comes after what? Psalm 2. Did you know that? If you didn't know that, if you look in your Bible, you got Psalm 3 right before it is Psalm 2. Good. You're all good students today. And Psalm 2 tells us how we're supposed to read Psalm 3. Pay attention. Here's what I mean. When you start this series, when we started this series on Psalms a few weeks back, I mentioned that the whole book of Psalms is intentionally structured. Remember we talked about it being in parts, part one, part two. So the way the Psalms are laid out in in the Bible are not haphazard. God ordained them to be laid out the way they are. And there's an intentional order. And sometimes by seeing how the book is structured, we're helped understand individual Psalms better. And I believe this is certainly the case for Psalm 3. So what is, it, what is Psalm 2 all about? We're not going to read the whole psalm, but I'll explain it to you. If you, if you read Psalm 2, um, the, uh, most students believe that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, uh, the first two psalms, are the introduction to the whole book of psalms, right? And they set an agenda on how we should understand the rest of the psalms. Psalm 2 is about the Davidic king, Right? And it's interesting, though, it never mentions the word David in Psalm 2. That's because it's clearly pointing beyond David. It's pointing ahead in time. It's looking forward to the coming Davidic king, the true David, who will be the true king over the world and rule forever. And we know that's Jesus. So let's read the first few verses of Psalm 2. It begins with trouble. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So this psalm is about conflict, right? It's about the Davidic king surrounded by his enemies who are threatening to take his life. But we find that this king will be established as a true king and rule over them. So if you look at the book of Psalms and you read Psalms, beginning with the picture of a David-like king who is opposed but overcomes, the king uh, is clearly... uh, the coming true king, Jesus Christ. So the king of Psalm 3 pictures the king of Psalm 2. We just read Psalm 2, we read Psalm 3. Psalm 3 is, and most of the next few dozen psalms give us the same picture with few details, or with different details. It's a picture of King David who suffers before overcoming. And so what all of these psalms, uh, what all of these psalms about David are doing is they're giving us a concrete picture of the king that's coming That's mentioned in Psalm 2. And it's taking the promise of this true future Davidic king 
and giving a repeated picture of him over and over and over in these psalms. So just as the king is opposed by the enemies in Psalm 2, David is surrounded by his enemies in Psalm 3. Just as the king will rule us uh, as a king in Psalm 2, David says God will lift and exalt his head and honor him again in Psalm 3. So Psalm 3, along with other patterns, similar patterns, is setting a pattern that Jesus would come and fulfill, right? And so we see that Jesus was also surrounded by enemies, wasn't he? Just like David in Psalm 3. Crowds cried out for Jesus' death, crucify him. We know that. Right before Jesus' crucifixion, he was surrounded by a whole battalion of soldiers who were against him, wasn't he? And on the cross, he was tempted to drop to a deeper level of anxiety and believe that God was against him. Think about it. They called his faith in his father into question just as David's enemies did. The soldier said to David, again in Psalm 3, 2 in the English Standard Version, many are saying of my soul there is no salvation or deliverance for him in God. The soldier said to Jesus in Matthew 27, 43, he trusted God, now let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. If your God is truly God, he'll deliver you off that cross, right? He's not going to help you. Saying the same thing they said about David. For David, God lifted his head in honor by saving him from death. They didn't kill him, we know that. But Jesus first needed to overcome, be overcome by his enemies because he needed to die for us. Jesus faced the ultimate anxiety-producing situation on the cross. And yet he never failed to trust his father. Never. He did it because of all of our anxious failures to trust God. So he just didn't die for our sin. He died for our unbelief and our lack of faith. He did it so that all of our sins of anxious fear and unbelief would be paid for. He took the punishment for our anxious sins and unbelief upon himself. And then he left them in the grave when he came up again. Because he is raised and he is exalted as the true king and he is in control. Amen? So we can trust him. We can trust Jesus. He is the king. He has our lives in his hands. He loves us. He won't let us drown in our troubles. We'll let us drown in our own troubles because we're too worried about him and not focusing on the king, right? Not resting in him. He won't let us face more than we can if we rest in him, if we look to him, right? But if we try to take it all on, it's always too much. Right? It's, breakfast, cooking breakfast is too much without Jesus. It's too stressful without Jesus. <laughs> in his death, Jesus took the punishment for our anxious sins. In his resurrection, he gave us the ultimate reason not to be anxious. Because he's alive. He has his control over everything that's going on in this world. He knows exactly how it's going to play out. He knows exactly when Ted's coming home. He knows exactly when... When uh, uh, Emily's going to be home with him, he knows all that. Why should we fret and worry? He's got it all figured out. There's a final thing this psalm, real quick in closing, that calls us to do. And that's to call, uh, so first we rest in God as our Father. And, and we find rest in our anxious minds. We look to the King, right? And find our fears calmed by his control. And third, start caring about someone else's problems. Start caring about someone else's problems. In other words, we start thinking about someone else versus ourselves. Because, you know, when we're anxious and worrying about me, 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 there's a sense of selfishness and pride there that will override you and overcome you. And that's what David does. He ends the psalm in verse 8 saying, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. He doesn't say salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon me. Right? He's now thinking about the rest of the people. Your blessing be upon your people. David's life was an immediate danger at that point. But he's not just thinking about himself. He's thinking about God's people. Right? He's thinking about other people. We saw a glimpse of this earlier. You may not have noticed it. Absalom gathered all the people on his side. David fled Jerusalem. But listen to why he fled. He told his faithful band of men in 2 Samuel 15 that they need to flee out of the city because Absalom may come and strike down the whole city of Jerusalem. So David left the city to protect those in Jerusalem. He was afraid that Absalom would come and just wipe the city out. So he just didn't run because he was afraid and he was thinking about me. 
He ran because he was thinking about God's people in Jerusalem. Amen? Let's stand, if you would. So our anxieties can often create this small, self-centered world. Right? It's all about me. And, and we start to view the world as if it, the only thing that matters is myself and my particular problem. And we think that God is not functionally part of it, or he, we don't functionally trust God, and people aren't functionally there for us either. It's all about me. And even when we're worried about someone else, when our anxiety keeps us up at night and consumes us during the day, it's actually distracting us from loving others and serving others. You can't love others and serve others if you're anxious all night and day. It just doesn't happen. And so this last point isn't so much a command to care about someone else, we're not supposed to hear this as, okay, get, to get rid of anxiety, I need to care about other people. It's more of a statement of what will happen when we rest in God, when we look to the king, when we trust in God, we'll start to care about other people. So David doesn't care about other people in order to not be anxious, but because he's already not anxious. Does that make sense? The anxiety is gone. Therefore, he now can care for other people. The result of trusting God resting in God, looking to God, then will allow us to care about other people. So in other words, as a result of resting in God our Father and trusting in King Jesus, we're freed from our own worries, we're freed from our own problems, then we're allowed and willing to care for other people. We'll not be able to use, uh, we, we then will be able to use that extra mental energy that we were wasting on anxious thoughts and that emotional energy to help other people in life with whatever they're dealing with. So if we want to be an others-focused community, which I believe we do, we need to be a God-focused, Jesus-focused, centered community first. Resting in God our Father. Trusting in Jesus as our King. Then we're able to get some sleep. Rest. Right? We'll have the energy to love other people. Amen? So God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you take care of our anxious thoughts that you take care of our worry, that you take care of our nervousness, that you take care of our fear. Lord, I pray that you help each one of us learn to rest in you, learn to fall back in your arms and let you hold us, and whatever burdens that we're carrying in our heart, that we're faithful and have faith in you, and we believe that you can take care of those things. Lord, let us not worry about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Let us not worry about 10 years from now. We don't know what 10 years is going to bring. Lord, but let us love you today. Let us rest in you today. Let us worship you today. Let us glorify you today. Lord, help us to look to you in all of our situations. Lord, because when we're looking inward at our problems, it's hard to look outward at you and see what you've done for us. Lord, I thank you that you were the perfect example of overcoming anxiousness on the cross. I am sure you were deathly afraid, but you still uh, stayed the course. You still trusted that God had a plan. And you followed through with that plan, which allowed freedom for all of us today of sin and death and anxiety. Lord, you freed us of that. We don't have to carry that in our hearts. It doesn't belong in a believer's heart. So God, we have faith in you today. We believe that you will take care of our anxieties. We rest in you. We thank you for that rest. God, and then we know the result of that will be allowing us to serve and care for other people. Because we're not so focused on me. And so, Lord, help us to, as we go through life, as we leave today, help us to think about when we're struggling with fear, when we're struggling with worry, when we're struggling with anxiety, are we using that word me? And if we are, Lord, help us to redirect that to you and to others. Because, God, we're not to focus. Yes, there's things in our lives that we need to focus on that are about me, Lord, but not to fret and worry, because you've taken care of all that. We sang the song, we cast all our cares on you, because you care for us, God. I thank you that you care for us. Lord, you care about how many hairs are on our head. You care about a hangnail that we may have. You care about the deepest problem that we may ever experience. Lord, you're not too big for our smallest problem, and you're not too small for our biggest problem. Lord, I thank you that you're never busy. When I need you, I can cry out to you, and you're there. Lord, that you don't put me on hold and say, I'll get back to you in an hour. Lord, that you're a God that's always there, always available for us when we need you. We just need to call out to you. We just need to give this stuff to you. You'll take it from us. You'll help us. You'll comfort us. You'll love us. So, God, I thank you for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to turn Psalm 3 into a song. 
I'm not going to play the keyboard. Um, part of this might have been a song before, um, but let's just let's see what happens here. So I'm going to start with, uh, we're going to use the old King James Version because I played around with this at home months ago. I didn't know he was going to preach out of Psalm 3 today. But um, let's see what happens. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Will you sing that with me? Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. The next one. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill again. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me again. I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about again. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Hallelujah. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Blessing. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Thou, thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Verse 6, I'll not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. For thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your psalms. We thank you for today's message. We thank you for how it applies to today. We thank you, Lord. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Your promises are forever. You see forever and your plans are perfect. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may go if you'd like to. I'm going to sing Cast My Cares here next, so if you'd like to sing that with us, feel free to stay.
fear feels bigger than my faith and struggles steal my breath away my back's pressed up against the wall the weight of my worries stacked up tall you're strong enough to hold it all i will cast my cares on you you're the anchor of my hope the only one who's in control i will cast my cares on you i trade the troubles of this world for your peace inside my soul this fight's not what i would have chosen do you see the future no one knows yet you're still good when i can You're holding it all. I will cast my cares on you. You're the anchor of my hope, the only one who's in control. I will cast my cares on you. I trade the troubles of this world for your peace inside my soul. I'm finding there's grief. my 
As we lift your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. as we 